A year ago at this time, life was very different for most of us. Before mask wearing, social distancing, and staying at home became a national pastime. A year into COVID-19, where do we stand today? What hope does the vaccine bring for tomorrow? And what about these new strains that we're hearing about? Where is the world during a pandemic one year in? We welcome Kristen Wenrick of the Bethlehem Health Bureau and Dr. Brian Nestor of Lehigh Valley Health Network to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. A year ago, life looked very different for most of us. We weren't wearing masks, we didn't need to be socially distanced, and most of us weren't staying at home unless, of course, by choice. A year into the COVID-19 pandemic, potentially the worst health crisis in 100 years, where do we stand a year in? And what hope do we have for the future as we look toward a vaccine? Pleased to welcome this evening, Kristen Wenrick from the City of Bethlehem's Health Department. Kristen, welcome to Face the Issues and thank you for being here, but also thank you for what you do every single day. Thank you for having me. Hey, Kristen, it's good to have you. Uh, I, I wanted to start by asking for your reflection. You have been at the health, the health department in Bethlehem for about a little over 20 years now, if I'm not mistaken. You've committed your life to public health. Um, COVID-19. Where does this rank on things you've seen as far as public health crises go? Definitely number one. Um, certainly we prepared for these types of events, um, but to the scale and duration that this has lasted, we just had never anticipated um, anything to this magnitude. Certainly we dealt with H1N1, we had Ebola, Zika. Uh, so we, we were, again, used to dealing with certain health issues, but no one could have anticipated last March when we were uh, first diagnosing our first cases of COVID-19 that we still a year later will be dealing with the same situation. Yeah, I remember you know, going back last March, uh, our viewers know I had COVID-19 back last March, one of the early cases, and uh, having been through and having been through H1N1, I remember thinking when this all started, this isn't going to last that long. This is, you know, we've had H1N1, to your point, we've had Ebola, we've seen crises like this. And yet here we are a year later and we're still talking about it. It's impacted our lives. It's impacted everything on the news. How has this been different? Obviously the magnitude, but how or, or even why from where you sit, has this been different than say H1N1? I mean, we never could have imagined complete shutdowns of our society where children weren't in school, where businesses were closed. Um, our sole you know, operations are focused on COVID-19 and have been largely since March. So that's definitely been a challenge because we have so many other public health issues that we're addressing on a daily basis. So to really have to take your staff and divert pretty much all of their time dealing with this issue for a year um, has been extremely challenging. And we know that suicides um, aren't going down, heroin and opioid overdoses aren't decreasing. We know that these other public health issues are out there and it's just you don't have the depth to be able to address everything as, as much as we'd like to. I think that's a, a interesting point that people don't always think about. You know, to your point, the opiate crisis didn't just go away. I mean, a year ago, these were things that we talked about regularly um, and didn't just disappear. And, you know, we see numbers that heart attack numbers are down, stroke numbers are down. There's no, they didn't just stop happening, but with all the attention being paid to COVID-19, people even being afraid to go to see their doctors with other conditions, um, we're ha there's an impact larger than just the virus. Uh, Chris, I want to run through some numbers here um, worldwide. And of course, this is as we're sitting here recording today. This is going to change uh, by the time our viewers are watching this. Worldwide, 101 million cases, 2.19 million deaths. In the United States, just shy of 26 million cases, 433,000 deaths. Uh, in Pennsylvania, 830,000 cases with 21,350 deaths. In the Lehigh Valley, uh, a little bit above 50,000 cases with a little bit more than 12 hundred deaths. You said earlier, you, this is the magnitude. You've never seen anything like this before. What has it been like working in your position? What has it been like working in public health during this pandemic? 
I mean, it's definitely grueling. Um, again, I think in the beginning, we had the, the energy and it was something new. So we were kind of, you know, getting accustomed to dealing with it. But as it's stretched on, it's a little bit like Groundhog Day. That's the only way to explain it. You feel like every day you come in and it's just it's the same thing. The one thing I love about public health is that we always focused on a variety of health issues. So one day you might be focused on heroin and opioid overdoses. The next day you're focused on, you know, healthy homes um, and making sure that homes are, are free of lead. Um, another day you might be focused on chronic diseases. So I, I love the variety and that we provided a variety of programming and not that one day was the same. That's really what attracted me to the field. And really, again, since this last year, I feel like every day has been the same. But I think you need to take one day at a time. That's really the only way I've managed. I know many of my staff, we've been working seven days a week, um, you know, obviously more than eight hour days. We've been conducting investigations. Anytime somebody is positive, we need to investigate that case, um, collect certain information, instruct them what they need to do as far as isolation. And then we need to obtain their contacts and do contact tracing. So we've had to really extend out our, our staff as well. So our, our, our staff were a staff of, of 25 individuals. So we had to hire some outside assistance to be able to help manage just the number of cases to make sure that we were investigating them effectively. And that has got to be taxing. I, I imagine, I mean, first of all, seven days a week, that's got to be physically taxing, but I imagine it's also emotionally draining at times. And, and how do you and your staff, I mean, we see so many stories of our frontline workers who are, are you know, they, they come in six, seven days a week and they're completely drained physically and emotionally. How has it been for you and your team and how do you deal with that? I have a great team. So that's first and foremost, I have really dedicated staff. I couldn't ask for, for better employees who have put their heart and soul into this and want to see us get out of the woods and get back to some type of normalcy. Again, having some extra outside help ha has certainly assisted. So we're looking at having some additional assistance with like the weekend work because the seven days is, is getting very, very tough. As we now are ramping up our vaccine clinics, that's added a whole um, other layer to this. So before we were focused on you know, mainly the, the investigations, the outbreaks. Now we have to still conduct that business, but we also need to run vaccine clinics multiple days a week where we're vaccinating upwards of over a thousand people at one clinic. So again, it, it's a lot of work, um, you know, just really trying to be that cheerleader and, you know, tell my staff that hopefully, you know, we're going to be out of the woods or somewhat out of the woods. Um, you know, over the next few months. And they know that what they're doing is making a difference with our community. And individuals that have come through our vaccine clinics are just so thankful, so grateful. Um, you know, they can't say enough about what we're doing. So that is very rewarding. You know that you're doing something good for the community. And people are just excited to get the vaccine because they can see their grandkids. They can get back to a little bit of a normal life. I want to ask you about those vaccines. Obviously, Operation Warp Speed, and produced a vaccine before the end of last year. And this has been kind of what a lot of us are hanging our hopes on. Uh, a number of different companies, Pfizer, Moderna, there, there's a number of different companies that have made this vaccine. It's here, but the state is, you know, in, across the country, all these states are rolling out in phases. Uh, well, the number one question people have is, when can I, I finally get a vaccine? Um, what has been the situation? You say you guys are doing a thousand doses per clinic. What has been the situation as far as vaccine shortages, what the expectation is, and when do we think we will be able to successfully vaccinate at least most of Americans so we can start heading towards herd immunity? Sure. So I think in the Lehigh Valley, we've done a pretty good job um, as far as when we move through the initial 1A phase. So if you remember, initially, it was really focused on the healthcare workers, long-term care facility residents, and long-term care facility staff. I think we did a really great job um, here locally vaccinating those groups. We were then prepped to start going to 1B. And I know the health, both health bureaus, Allentown and Bethlehem, as well as the healthcare networks, were both planning to move towards vaccinating some of those populations. I think everybody was taken aback when the state decided to expand the 1A group with now including individuals over the age of 65 and then including those from 16 to 64 with certain health conditions. And that's definitely maxed out the system. There is a huge group that's part of that 1A uh, expansion. 
And again, we just we can't meet the demand with the vaccine that we're receiving. We're hoping that it continues to improve. Um, up until this week, we have gotten the doses that we've asked for, but starting this week, we did start to see less of a supply coming from the Department of Health. What do you tell individuals who are trying to get scheduled to get their vaccines? Uh, I mean, what's your message? A lot of them are gonna be watching this program. What's your message to them as far as when they may be able to expect the vaccine and what should they be doing in the meantime? Well, one thing that we are seeing that's causing a bit of a problem is people are booking vaccine at three, four different locations. Hmm. So people need to realize that's taking slots away from other people. So we stress if you're going to book at one place, book your appointment and keep your appointment at that location, um, because then we'll get people that don't show up to our clinics. And those are spaces that we could have allocated to other individuals. So I think that's just one important thing to stress um, to community members. We're also at the point where we certainly couldn't have anticipated that people from other states, people from all over Pennsylvania are trying to get into our local clinic. Our vaccine allotment is really based on you know, our population size. So although we don't wanna turn anybody away because the vaccine is coming from the federal government, we do have to prioritize and make sure that we're providing for our residents here locally. All right. And those other regions are also getting allotments of the vaccine, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, with the vaccine, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, and, and you know, we'll, future episodes of the show, we'll dive more into the vaccine and what an RNA vaccine is and so forth. But there's two shots to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And there's a lot of talk about just once you've had the vaccine does not mean you just go out and meet in large groups and you don't socially distance and you don't wear a mask. Why is that? I mean, there's some frustration to say, I got vaccinated, why can't I just resume my normal everyday activities? Correct. They're not really sure how infectious you could be, like even if you're vaccinated. So that's one of the reasons that they're still um, requiring the mask usage, the social distancing, just because you're vaccinated doesn't necessarily mean that you couldn't pass coronavirus on to somebody else. Hmm. Okay. But the, the two dose series of the vaccine has in the trials proven to be very um, effective, up to 95%. And I think we're seeing those those numbers. New York Times just had the article recently that as we as, as people begin getting that first and even second dose now. We're beginning to see hospitalizations and case numbers start to decline. Um, there is a report out from Israel that where they have successfully vaccinated those 65 and older, uh, now a much smaller population to be fair, um, but that they are now seeing up to 60% decline in the hospitalizations. So to your point, seems like the vaccine is certainly uh, very effective. Um, what would you say to people who are perhaps reprehensible about or reprehensive about getting the vaccine um, or apprehensive in saying, hey, I, I'm not sure I want to do or I have concerns about it. Well, we actually surveyed community members um, probably about about two months ago, just looking um, as far as what the intent was for receiving the vaccination. So we asked if they plan to receive it and if they didn't plan to receive it, what was the reason why? Mm -hmm. And I think there was a lot of concern because I think the name Operation Warp Speed didn't really help matters. <laughs> People thought that it wasn't going, this um, vaccine wasn't going through the appropriate um, channels of approval, that they were fast tracking things. And although it was fast tracked, when you understand the, the background to what they were doing, that um, things were happening concurrently throughout the process. And you had um, vaccine manufacturers that were producing this vaccine as it was going through the trials because they were given a large, large sums of money from the federal government to be able to do so. So there's some vaccine that it went into production and through the trials, it was shown not to be effective or that it had adverse outcomes. And those vaccines aren't going to be publicly available. Um, so it was just that things were happening concurrently and, and it wasn't that things were not being going through the normal process, should I say. That's but a good... I think that seems to be the biggest concern for people that they felt like it was fast tracked um, as far as the approvals and things were skipped during the process. That's a good reassurance. I used to work for the federal government. I can tell you, we do not come up with the best names for programs sometimes. Kristen, last question for you. Uh, you know, we're a year into the COVID-19 pandemic. There is hope with this vaccine, we're starting to see in other places around the world, uh, numbers being affected in a good trend because of this vaccine. What is your message for people right now with regards to the pandemic? I know there's certainly pandemic fatigue. Everyone wants to get back to a normal life and we're, we're you know, social creatures. People wanna be able to go to concerts and parties and have their children back in school. And I think if, if we can get this vaccine and people take advantage of getting this vaccine when it is widely available, 
the sooner we'll be able to get back to some sort of normalcy because we're all, you know, from those working in the professional healthcare fields to, you know, everyday residents, everybody's in the same boat that we just want to get back to some sort of normal state. You almost forget what that feels like because mm -hmm. we've been living with this for so long. Yeah. Well, Kristen, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for what you do. And you and your team are, are really heroes. You've been on the front lines. Uh, we thank you. We salute you. And you are certainly in our prayers day in and day out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. When we come back, Dr. Brian Nestor, CEO and president of Lehigh Valley Health Network, will join us to continue this conversation on COVID-19 one year in. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. I'm now joined by Dr. Brian Nestor, President and CEO of Lehigh Valley Health Network. Dr. Nestor, thank you and welcome to Face the Issues. Of course, Sam, good to see you again. Good to see you as always. Before we, we get into the questions here, uh, how are you and your family doing and, and how have you guys been throughout this pandemic? Oh, well, at a personal level, doing, doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we've been, uh, it's been a challenge for everybody. I guess the, the most notable thing in my family is my uh, daughter has wound up uh, uh, as a site coordinator for two COVID-19 testing uh, sites in vulnerable communities in Philadelphia. So uh, as of today, she's in 22 degree weather, you know, with full PPE on uh, doing the COVID testing. So uh, she's the hero in our family. So, uh, and it just does highlight how challenging it is for many of our vulnerable communities to get good access to not only care, but the testing that allows them to stay safe. Mm -hmm. So we're all good. So thanks for asking. Yeah, and, and hats off to her. I remember when she was uh, first going to college. And so to hear that certainly makes me feel old, but hats off to her and to your family for what you guys do. Uh, I mean, Dr. Nestor, obviously we, we are a year in to COVID-19. Um, I, I think most people in the public a year ago were doing things very differently. Uh, they weren't socially distancing, they weren't wearing masks, we were going to concerts and things like that. And a year later, everything has changed. Now you've been in medicine for quite a bit as both a doctor and an administrator. How does this pandemic compare to other things you've seen in the past? Uh, nothing, nothing compares. Uh, this is uh, different in uh, every, no matter how you slice and dice it. Uh, um, this is, uh, I mean, the category we throw it in is in into disaster management. Uh, and we have, we're pretty deep in disaster management, emergency service management, um, hazardous material, crisis management. Uh, so we're ready and we love doing that stuff. So uh, we're quite prepared. I think uh, the good news is that we've had, if we've had anything familiar about this, it was with uh, SARS, H1N1, mm -hmm. We have always been fortunate here, well before I got here 22 years ago, to have very deep infection control processes. Uh, and actually, I just resurrected this story, which many people just forget. But in 2003 with SARS, mm -hmm. there were four total cases in America that penetrated the United States. And one of them was at Lehigh Valley Hospital in Yolmer. Oh, wow. Um, and it was uh, f uh, picked up by a uh, one of our ER docs who asked the right questions, found that the patient was not feeling well for several days, asked about recent travel, had come in from Toronto into ABE airport, and before that attended a wedding in China. Uh, uh, sure enough, the patient was placed immediately in the negative pressure, contained 10, 10 hours later, a DC-10 of uh, CDC officials were on site. So we, we have a lot of experience with surveillance for these types of things. Uh, uh, we are one of four Ebola centers for the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So I think this is kind of stuff we like to take charge of, but nothing prepares you for this to answer your question. Wow. And what what are, are some of the, the changes that we've seen? I mean, obviously, LVHNs had to adjust, but also, you know, other conditions don't just disappear. And, and I mean, when you look at the numbers, it seems like it almost looks like less people are having heart attacks and strokes and so forth. I can't imagine that being the case. Uh, what's led to, to those number drops? Are people afraid to come to the hospital? Or, or and how have you guys adjusted to that? I think many people are, Sam. I think you hit it right on the nose. And, uh, uh, you know, it's changed. Everyone reacts to these circumstances differently. They have different interpretations on whether they wear a mask, whether mm -hmm. they should get the vaccine. Maybe we can talk about those things. But there are, uh, uh, there are people out there uh, and I, I'm one of them, too. I, I never like going to the doctor. I, I like to, to uh, hey, I'm feeling good. Life must be fine. Mm -hmm. That's not how you manage your health. Mm -hmm. And people are very willing to look 
to the first excuse as to why they don't have to follow up for care, or maybe it's no big deal. And I think that's really harmed a lot of people. Hmm. We are high single digit to double digit lower percentages of MIs, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, and strokes coming into our emergency department. Wow. It's not that they're not happening. They're happening at home and people are blowing them off. That, that, that keeps me up at night. I worry about that. I would say hospitals are safe. Our doctor's offices are safe. Do not put off your care. We can, uh, as they say, walk and chew gum at the same mm. time. We can take care of COVID-19 people, not get you infected. Yeah. And I think that's such an important point because people are afraid, and rightfully so, of COVID-19, the, the death rate and so forth. But you're not going to be safe if you're suffering from a heart attack or a stroke and not in hospital care. This is all, all essentially casualties of the pandemic. You're, you're exactly right. People should prioritize their care. Um, uh, again, you, you don't want to infect, you don't want to be typhoid uh, Mary or John, right? Mm. Uh, so you want to protect yourself, you want to protect your family, but you can, you, can, you can go back to your normal engagement with your doctor, the use of express care locations, to get your MRI or CT. We've shown that we can do these extremely safely. And by the way, in particular, we, we are well below national and state average for the spread of, of uh, COVID-19. Most of the spread that we have amongst our workforce, below 1%, okay? And most of that, they get it from their community or families. So uh, the hospital is a safe environment. Please, I, I wish the listeners would. I think that's fantastic advice, Dr. Hester. And obviously moving forward, a lot of hope with the new vaccines, whether from Pfizer or Moderna or so forth. But there's also a lot of confusion, I think, among some people, concern of uh, the vaccine, whether it's safe. Uh, perhaps naming Operation Warp Speed wasn't the best idea, uh, but there's concern with the vaccine. Um, what is your advice to patients and to viewers about this vaccine, whether they should get it, how it's been developed? Is it safe and is it effective? Certainly in my career, medically, I've never seen anything like this. So from that standpoint, Operation Warp Speed was, uh, in my mind, a miracle. Mm -hmm. To see two vaccines developed within a year, I, I, uh, we're, we, our medical community remains astounded. We do have some challenges now mm -hmm. in terms of production and dissemination. That's, that's a challenge. But uh, we have uh, really followed uh, the, the rigorous FDA approach. I believe 100 percent that the uh, the FDA looked and scrutinized the development of these vaccines in the same way they would have with uh, a development of a SARS or H1N1 or even the influenza vaccine. I feel very, very confident about that. We should remember that these are being used now under emergency use authorization, EUA. That is not the final evaluation to get final clearance. However, it is good enough. The safety profile is good enough and I believe very, very safe, that it, it's, it's, it can be used wide, widespread across the country. Um, to, to give you an example of how confident I am in that, uh, um, I have received the vaccine, certainly. My daughter as a frontline uh, 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 personnel in a, in a COVID site. Has, she's of childbearing age, she's 24 years old. She has gotten the vaccine. Uh, I am not worried about this, okay? Now, uh, I understand though that many are concerned that we don't have the final analysis on what happens if I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. already what happens if i'm about to get pregnant uh we don't have all those answers and i i understand uh those uh that those are justifiable reasons to be a little cautious maybe to wait for more data i get that but i uh, by and large um if you're a uh, healthy individual or even an individual that has medical risk and conditions or you are of age uh with other 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 comorbidities get the vaccine that's what we should be doing right now one of the other questions that we hear a lot is there are these new strains, these mutations, the, the British strain from South Africa, the, the other strain. Do we know if the vaccine protects against these strains as well? So far, and I'm not the, the science, chief science officer on this, but I, uh, we're, we're, I'm, we're two, two uh, mutations first identified uh, in Britain, the second one in South Africa. It is my understanding that both of those are covered by the vaccines that have currently been placed out there. Uh, my worry about mutations are those are the first two. Mm, all right, okay. there will be others. And the longer we kind of uh, uh, take in order to get herd immunity, which so, many, so many hear about, and that's where you have a sufficient number of community members vaccinated to kind of, if you will, erode and evaporate the virus, 
um, uh, the virus remains in in the community ready to mutate. Mm -hmm. So uh, and so far, we've been fortunate. The first two uh, mutations appear to be something the vaccines can handle. That could change. Another reason for us to get going with this rapid dissemination of the vaccine uh, for all communities. So is the idea here that we want to vaccinate and uh, achieve a herd immunity before we see more mutations that potentially the vaccine isn't as effective against? That's one of the reasons, and, and certainly uh, it's the biggest one in, in my mind, uh, and uh, why we should be doing everything we can. And I think I think everyone is trying to do everything they can. Uh, there's lots of talk about why vaccinations are low, uh, uh, why uh, you know production is not what it should be, what the problems are between the federal, the state, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and everyone else. Uh, uh, the bottom line is there's not enough vaccine supply uh, out there yet. When the federal government wrote the plan for vaccination uh, around the warp speed uh, approach, they said there would be three phases. The first phase is that production will by no means match demand. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be the first few months. So keep in mind, we only started vaccinating at the end of December. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we are at the end of January. OK, so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that there is maybe a vaccine scarce environment for even into March. OK, but then we should slowly get into this longer period, okay, of say three, four, five, six months where supply and demand match, okay? Uh, and then after that will be phase three where the, the supply out, out uh, way outpaces the demand. Uh, that's when we can really get everybody. But that means that these first six months are critical to make sure that we are most uh, uh, delivering the vaccine as expeditiously and efficiently. And I, I would use this opportunity, if you don't mind, to say the best way to do that is use health systems to do that. Mm -hmm. We have the capacity, we have the know-how, we have the team seven days a week that can deliver this. You know, right now, uh, our, our, uh, the most we've delivered in a single day is a little over 3,200 vaccines. Our current capacity is 20,000. Hmm. Uh, we have, and, and I'm sorry, 25,000. And we've been asking for up to 21,000 doses a week. Um, you know, they, they just don't, ha the state doesn't have that stockpile uh, for us. And uh, we're not the only ones delivering vaccine. I would tell you, we could do monstrous more uh, vaccinations. We had, as you know, our first Dorney Park event mm -hmm. where you only had enough vaccine to do a little over a thousand vaccines. We could do 4,500 there uh, tomorrow if we had the vaccination. Yeah. And, and last question for you, Dr. Nestor, also along with the vaccines, LVHN is rolling these out free of charge to the public, right? Oh, certainly. Yeah. You know, this is a community health mission. Uh, everyone needs to get it. Um, and I would also like to make this point. I know you care about street medicine mm -hmm. and your volunteer work, uh, Sam. Uh, and, and vulnerable populations of which homeless, uh, homelessness is an issue. But, but there are a lot of vulnerable community members out there. Live, and, and what we know is we know where they live. Mm -hmm. We know where people that are, uh, have social and economic obstructions in their life and have other medical problems and don't have access to healthy foods, don't have access to uh, uh, support structures in their life, don't have access to COVID testing or the vaccine, we have to work doubly hard to get that vaccine there. So the good news is that next week you'll be seeing uh, our very first mobile unit out there, our mobile vaccination unit. It'll be like, hey, there's that action news van again. <laughs> uh, you'll see that, uh, that we'll have four of those literally just to get into hard to reach neighborhoods where we know the population there is at risk and vulnerable. Uh, but then there's also the mass vaccination of our, our Dorney sites. We have three other sites that the tents are going up. They just went up today at Northampton Community College. Mm -hmm. Next week, they're going up at another location. Uh, we have some big box uh, places available, and that's all in addition to 30 uh, physician practices and uh, five uh, hospital campuses. So uh, we have lots of potential here to give vaccine. This is a vaccination issue that can be solved. We can do it. We just need the doses. We have the capacity and know-how. We can't wait to deliver on this mission. And we can do this. Dr. Nestor, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the work that you and your family are doing. Thank you, and please stay safe. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is our show for this evening. Thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to joining, for you to join us again next week. Until then, my name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night. <laughs>